Hey, this is a Hakawadi production. Hey, welcome to the men's room, the show where you'll get to know some of the region's most game changing entrepreneurs, CEOs, musicians. And today we have an adventurer in the studio. Our guest is the unbelievable, Everest climbing, desert conquering, and ocean crossing, Maxime Shaya. Welcome, Maxime. Hi, Nadia. So you describe yourself as an avid mountaineer and explorer, but you're also quite uh, an athlete, right? You stay fit and you're into running and races. And I you just myself. Or, uh, do you don't describe yourself like well, that? You don't describe yourself as an athlete, but I'm guessing that you must train pretty hard to do all that stuff. And you also just organized the Ultra Trail des Cedres, a uh, 75-kilometer race in on mountain trails in the Cedars of Lebanon. Can you yes, tell us yes. what that's all about? Yes. Ultra Trail des Cedres, it's actually a French name because Cedres, Cedars in French. But trail is an English word. Why is it Ultra it's not, Trail? No, no, Ultra Trail is also French. All right. Ultra Trail. Ultra, ultra is, and trail has become French just like sandwich, just like... Uh, okay. Yeah. Trail uh, is like sandwich. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just like lots of these, like weekend. They use mm-hmm. a, I think it's become in the, in the French uh, okay. uh, dictionary. Did not know that. So this is, this is a race that is uh, running and... Um, Ultra means longer than marathon. Trail means on trails rather than on tarmac or paved roads. And um, I I don't know if you know the area, but the Shouf Cedar Reserves, the reserve, which is the largest in Lebanon and which houses some amazing cedar trees proprietary to Lebanon, um, it has such amazing trails. And when you run amid those trees, it's 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 magic and actually well almost everyone who, who who ran and some people wrote testimonials about that so this was a project for 2020 um but i woke up like one night like two and a half months ago and i thought why not start it this year and get the ball rolling because i know that in a few years and i've challenged myself that in a few years Uh, UTC, Ultra Trail des Cedres, will become an internationally recognized ultra trail event in this friendly country that is Lebanon, which, contrary to many beliefs, has beautiful mountains. Uh, We're blessed with high mountains and we're blessed with, uh, of course, uh, snow in the winter, etc. And uh, where such a race is amazing. And actually, this morning I was speaking to Sharif, who climbed Everest this year. I think Sharif is... Sharif, who's Sharif? I think he's Egyptian. I don't know his last name. Oh. Um, he did run... Sharif who climbed Everest. There must not be that many. No, there must not be that many. <laughs> he's right now in, in Dubai and he spoke to me this morning and he said to me, Max, um, uh, uh, UTC should be on the World Ultra Trail Tour. He's run many, many ultras. He's an ultra Yeah, guy. because it's kind of a worldwide trend, right? There's a lot of those in Europe and stuff. It's, is it a yes, network? Yes, yeah. yes. And, and, and I read an amazing article in the t- Daily Telegraph. The guy was saying... Who would want to run on paved roads when you can run on trails? Who would want to run between uh, concrete when you can run in national parks? And who, who would want to run up and down speed bumps when you can run up and down mountains? So yes, this is the trend. And uh, that's that's with regards to trails. And with regards to ultra, yes, it is also the trend because... Like me, long ago, nowadays, a lot of people want to challenge themselves and beat themselves and and find out the new themselves by pushing the limits. Yeah. So you organized it this year because have you ever run one before? Well, um, I crossed the desert uh, on my bicycle, which is okay, more than okay, a trail. Okay, we'll talk about that a bit I, well, later. No, hold on a second. <laughs> have bragging. I ever run an ultra? <laughs> no, I have. Hold on a second. No, no, okay. but, no, but Lahsen Ansal, who has won the Marathon des Sables 10 times, He's Moroccan. The Marathon des Sabres is the mother of all ultras. Okay, he's won it 10 times. He's a legend. I drove him to the to, to, to Beirut airport this morning. He stayed at my place for a week. Um, him and I are cooking up something for us to run the next or the 2020 Marathon des Sables for charity somehow. So stay tuned on that. Okay, sounds tiring. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I, you organized this event. And actually, I heard from a lot of people who were part of it that it was exquisitely well organized because a lot of these events can be a little bit um, can be a little chaotic I mean how many people run this race 
I was expecting 100. We got more than 200, which was a good problem to have. Uh, but uh, you say it was it was exquisite. Well, you can improve on anything, and I know that 2020 will be a lot Even better. better. And I, I, I you know... Because the thing I, is, 200 doesn't sound like that many people, but no. when you're talking about narrow trails in the woods, if you're not well organized in every way, I mean, you can have like a, people tripping all over each other. Um, well, that the, could be one problem. UTC had three races. One is 25K to get yeah. people to know this. Uh, and then one is 45, and then the big one is 75. The 75K had a 3 a.m. start oh, with wow. a 16-hour cutoff time, so they had to be back. How long was this one? Your, S- 75K. This one? Yeah, okay, that's no, one. no, no. How long did it? What was the duration? Well, uh, well, so, so, well. one lady did uh, was on the trail for 17 hours. I waited oh, for goodness. her until she got in. Although her cutoff time was, was uh, 16 hours. Wow. Yeah. She did 17 hours in 25 minutes, but she made it. Wow. And I waited for her. It was dark. I just hugged her. That's insane. <laughs> then I had to go. I had to go home. And and so yeah, um, there was three races uh, to get people to know this, uh, and um, the longer one was seventy five, and a lot of people, and that is amazing. A lot of people had never run seventy five. I have an amazing message from a lady actually from Canada, um, and uh, she says she's never done this, and she says she went through all of the. Uh, feelings that anyone can encounter, like uh, uh, exuberation, fear, I can't translate in from hallucinations, uh, pain, agony. Uh, emo- she went through all of the emotions, but she made it, although she had a problem in her knee. And uh, and she she actually said it was the best thing she's, she'd ever done in her life. Mm. So so were there issues with uh, with uh, having all those people kind of running on this uh, in this small space? How do it's, you... it's not a small space. It's a huge space. Well, lengthwise, but I mean, if everyone's starting at the same time. No, no, there's no, the, the problem is not, does not lie there. Okay. But there's always problem, Nadia. I mean, you're pushing people to do things which is sometimes beyond their limit or at their limit. And like, I'll tell you one thing. One guy came up to the 75 kilometer race start line. Uh, he did not have a headlight. He did not have a backpack. That would have been me, like, if I came to the race. I'd be, like, well, well, without he, water. But he made it. He did? He did. And I'm going to give him a medal, although he went... He shouldn't have been... Allowed to sh- run. Yes. And, and plus, he brought single-use plastic, which is something... It's a no-no. I was, it's a big no-no for me. And I actually distributed uh, um, refillable bottles, aluminium bottles printed with UTC uh, on them in order for uh, people to, or in order to raise awareness about this yeah. horrible thing called single. As you know, Canada two weeks ago voted out single-use plastic. There is no such thing as single-use plastic in Canada. And by 2020 in Europe, there will not be any as well. Hopefully one day. It's amazing that you can incorporate this in, in something like Iran. You know, everyone has to start it for things to change to um, implement this kind of stuff in whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm. So Now, during a marathon, great. You, you drink from single-use plastic bottles and you throw them. Yeah. And of course, people, well, I mean, we, well, they pick them up and I'd like to think that they recycle, like, recycle them in the proper way. But how can you do that on a trail and in a huge mountain, 75 kilometers of trails? Yeah, that would have been a disaster. That. If it would have been a disaster. Bottles. That's why. So the guy comes with just one 300 yeah. milliliter single-use plastic bottle. He doesn't have his phone <laughs> with the SOS number uh, programmed in. No backpack. Nothing. My God. So I will give him a medal. But I've written today. I posted um, a message on the website www.ultratraildescedres.com. Dot com. <laughs> Point com. Point com. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I posted a message in three languages, French, English, so what and Arabic. Did, what, what, yeah, so go ahead, finish. Just saying that this year I'll be lenient. Yeah. Okay, and many of you um, had infringements. Some of you were, should not have even been given the start. But uh, I promise you that next year, for this race to become international and for people to um, respect us, as a race organizer and Lebanon as a race venue will have to apply the rules. Yeah, and you have to adhere to certain standards. Yes, ma'am. Makes sense. Um, so what are some of the challenges then? You were talking about some, some things that are difficult. Oh, well, you can imagine. We had 11 checkpoints for the 75-kilometer race, of which seven were for the 45-kilometer race, and of which four 
were for this 25 kilometer race. Also, you have to have water at every checkpoint. Also, you have to have people manning the checkpoints and ticking off the participants. Also, you have to know which participants are still on the course beyond the, the, the cutoff time and you have to pick them up. Also, you have injuries and you have to deal with were that. Were there a lot of injuries? By the way, I have to say a great big thank you to the Red Cross who helped me in two ways. They had two hats on that race. One, their job is to, you know, they had 42, they call them ka, cases of injuries which they dealt with amazingly well. One person ended up in hospital because uh, he was hallucinating. Was it that guy with the little bottle of no, water? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. And the other thing that the Red Cross did amazingly well for the first time, and with just a quick briefing from me, was they manned the checkpoints. And they did it very well. I also want to thank the Shuf Cedar Reserve people, who, without whom we couldn't have done this. And can I thank my sponsors? There's just four. No. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Who are, so, who are the sponsors of this wonderful race? Well, listen. I, who supports No, no, I have to thank them. I'll tell projects. you why, Nadia. Because, like I said to you, I decided this two and a half months ago. Yeah. And, so they worked quickly. And, and I just gave a few calls to people. It's yeah. people. It's, yeah. not, it's not companies. Sure. I called Marwan Khairuddin. AM Bank was in. I called uh, Talal Ashair. And Dar al Handasa was in. I called Nabil Bustros and Midis Group was in. And I called Mr. Hayek. Yeah. And Alpha was in. So all four Amazing. are. Uh, well, you're a well liked guy, I guess. It's hard to say no to you. And it's, it's not, such a positive uh, project. That hey, also, this is the men's room. You're not a, yeah. I think what they you're know is. You're popular in the men's room, Maxim. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you <laughs> You're Nadia. welcome. But in the men's room, there's only <laughs> Nadia. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you think. So actually, I was asking a lot about the organization because um, when it comes to these kinds of events, uh, events and act like uh, challenges, it, there's uh, dangers involved. I mean, when you're uh, obviously in a run, it's not as challenging. But you've done a lot of mountain climbing, and there's been a lot of accidents uh, this year. We've heard yeah, about mountain about, climbing is me. The, the race I organize for others. Yeah, but me, I'm, we don't I'm, care about. I care about others. <laughs> no, no. But I'm talking. I'm leaning over time. I'm, I, I want to ask you yes. about mountain climbing. Yes. Because. People were kind of, uh, I mean, it, there was a lot of media attention this year on at least 11 people who died climbing Mount Everest. Yes. And the, just recently, uh, yesterday, I think, or recently, there's news of another eight people in the Himalayas that uh, uh, died in an avalanche. The, and there's video of them. We found their camera buried in the snow. Yes. They were being very careful. There was an avalanche. So, um, first of all, uh, is that part of the appeal of doing these kinds of things, the risk taking and the oh, idea no. that you might not come back alive? I don't think so. No, no, no. Listen, it's normal. There was 11 deaths this year. There was two, there was 13 in 2006 when I climbed the mountain. Okay. Um, people die on the mountain and they usually die coming back from the summit. Uh, it How happens do they, what, what happens to them? Why are they... Well, you, you, if you sit down from exhaustion, you just freeze to death and you cannot get up again. Wow. Okay? And then you're in this area called the death zone. Yeah, 8,000 uh, meters and up. Just and above 1,000 meters, yeah. yes. Well, some people even... And, and, and in this zone, you, you know, your body is eating itself. You cannot, with, you cannot stay there forever. Um, you just got to go peak there, steal the summit, as they say, and then come back. Um, and if you spend too much time in there... Um, your body's... Uh, uh, is it because of the oxygen? oxygen? Yeah, yeah the, the oxygen is there, but the pressure is not there, so you're not able to assimilate all of the oxygen. So on the summit of Everest, you have a third of the oxygen that you and I enjoy in the men's room. <laughs> <laughs> Mighty fine smelling oxygen, I might add. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But listen, you said mountain climbing is dangerous. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. But so is driving a car, and people drive cars every Especially day. Especially in More people die cities, yeah. on highways than, than they true. do on the mountain. That's true. So yeah, when you do not respect the mountain, then you run into trouble. Nobody conquers the mountain. Nobody challenges the mountain. You challenge yourself mm -hmm. on the mountain. Yeah. And as long as you know that, uh, as long as you know that the mountain will always be there, and that you can always go back and climb it, then you 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 stay within the limits. And you keep the back door open to return to your loved ones alive. <laughs> Hopefully. So you've actually climbed seven summits. You've done quite a bit of mountain climbing. Is I climbed right? what's called the seven summits, the, oh, the, highest, seven the summits. highest peak on each continent. And I ended it with Everest. Okay. But in order to do these, I climbed many, many other summits. 
Wow, super impressive. Um, but you're not just into mountain climbing. No. You're also, you've done some pretty wild things, some, gone on some pretty wild adventures. One you, of them is in your country. I began uh, from the north of Canada mm -hmm. at Ward Hunt Island, just north of Eureka. And I, I have no idea where that is. Yeah, well, but nobody okay. does. It nobody sounds does. really smart or like... Smart? Eureka? I don't know. Eureka, Why, success? Eureka? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's like a base in the north of Canada where the last census showed six people uh, on a rotational basis. It's like a... It's like a but this is the, 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 the extreme north of Canada from where I skied to the North Pole. You skied to the North Pole? Yes. How cold was it? Oh, extremely cold. Especially in the beginning when the sun was not yet above the horizon. So we started off with with no sun. And then... You mean like the whole, like it was like dark all day yes, long? Yeah. not dark. Yeah. The twilight. Because we started off on the 3rd of March. So the sun would come close to the horizon, but never above it. So we'd never see it. Mm. But by the end, uh, when we reached the pole on the 25th of April, so 2009... So how, how long did that take? 53 days. Oh my goodness. But by then, by 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 twenty fifth of April, there's twenty four hours sunlight. But in the beginning, it's very very cold, ex especially when you're close to land, when you're close to Canada. So when we landed, what was the pilot's name? Very Canadian name. It's Twin Otters. Jean Guy. <laughs> no, <laughs> probably uh, not. The the, the the company is called Ken Boric Air. Okay. They have they have um, these little. Uh, twin otters equipped with skis to land. So he lands and he goes out and he goes to the back door and he opens it and he holds it with both hands so it doesn't smash uh, on, on the fuselage from the wind. And he tells me, I was sitting right there, he tells me, Max, welcome to nowhere. The temperature is minus 48. Ugh, that's <laughs> crazy. And and you didn't get back on like the, get back on and like go home. Oh, I mean, no, that's I'd, crazy. I'd prepared for this for ages. So I'd been to the North Pole before, but I had skied what's called the last degree. One degree is 60 nautical miles. The pole is at 90 degrees north. So we were dropped at 89 degrees and we skied there um, with uh, with a bunch of Norwegians. It was very, very hilarious. Uh, with my good friend Birge Ausland. He's, um, he's another polar explorer. And it took seven or eight days. So I'd been there before and I wanted to do what's called an all the way. So mm -hmm. from land all the way to the pole, both for the North Pole and the South Pole. Wow. That's brave. Um, you've also crossed the Indian Ocean on a rowboat. That's yes. kind of uh, that was the craziest different, thing uh, I've ever done. Is it really yes, to date? It doesn't sound crazier than what you just described to me, anyways. Oh no, no, no! Listen, Everest was dangerous and difficult. North Pole, uh, South Pole is like a walk in the park. Okay, it's like a holiday <laughs> on ice. <laughs> okay, but North okay. Pole was extremely dangerous and cold, and and you get open water. Uh, you get open leads and you have to cross them, wear your, your dry suit and swim across. And, oh my goodness. And then there's the polar bears, etc., etc. Wow. But then the Indian Ocean, starting off in Western Australia and rowing all the way to Africa in 57 days. Nothing but open water in sight with two other smelly men with no men's room aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, that was crazy. Um, and we had, you know, in, in 57 days, we took food for 90 days. We finished in 57, which was a Guinness World rec Record. We actually um, established three Guinness World Records. So wait, wait, wait. Did you have all your food on your boat with you? Was it just you guys and the small boat? You didn't have like a support vessel or anything? No support vessel, no nothing. If you're given one single biscuit along the way, the Ocean Rowing Society does not recognize it as a crossing. Wow. So you brought, how, how, what kind of food can you, like 90 days is a lot of food. We brought a lot of chocolate. Oh, I should show you the, 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 the documentary. Uh, but we took also a lot of dehydrated dehydrated food. Yeah. It's all stashed in the, in the hatches below deck. Same thing that astronauts uh, bring, yes, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So you rode for 57 days. We did. Do you sleep at night? Like, do you take shifts? You do, but only for two hours, not more, never more. You sleep for two hour we take, yeah, windows? Yeah, we, 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 we practiced what's called polyphasic sleep. So you sleep for two hours and then you row for two hours and then you sleep for two hours. And then you... Actually, we did another plan. We, we did two hours of sleep, four hours off. Two hours, sorry, two hours of rowing, yeah, four hours off. I would be confused off. too, I'd be like... Yeah, well, well, listen... <laughs> Yes, we got <laughs> confused because I had devised a rowing a rostrum, 
uh, made by those who do the Vendée Globe, the sleep, ex sleep deprivation experts. And it was very complicated. Sometimes it was two rowers, sometimes it was one, sometimes it was an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. Then our desalinator broke down, so we could not row in pairs. We had one person on the handheld desalinator. Oh, you had a handheld one, thank goodness. Oh, yeah, thank goodness. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So yeah. see, that's a, an example of where you could have died. Oh, yeah. I could have died coming to the yeah. <laughs> to the men's room today. Yep. <laughs> yeah, on, on Lebanese roads. Yeah. Listen, I respect nature. But not... wouldn't that be a better place to die, actually, than to be of in... Course. Of course. Yeah. Nature. Yeah. Of course. And that is why, actually, the people who die on Everest stay there. Because the indigenous people from, from, from the region, the, the Sherpas, do not touch any corpse because they believe that when a, a mountain claims a life, it becomes part of the mountain. Secondly, why would you want to risk other people's life to drag a body down? You know how difficult it is? It is, it is dangerous enough to, with crampons and, 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 and icy surfaces to, 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 to move yourself. How yeah. would you want to dra drag a, a, a sack of potatoes? And thirdly, <laughs> why would you want to drag somebody down to bury him or her uh, in the sand where the worms will eat. You're in a, you're in a perfectly, mm. you know, you're in a morgue and your your body's perfectly preserved. Yeah. And then the view Cryotherapy is... Cryotherapy, possibly. Maybe, maybe. And then if, if he or she chose to go there and they... Why would you want to bring them back to... I know the families want to see... Yeah. I used to, I used to think like that, but yeah. when you think about it in a different light... Never thought about that. That's an interesting... Uh, point so um you've also biked across the i'm not trying to pronounce this the rubal khali desert which is uh, the empty quarter in english the empty quarter a thousand yeah. kilometers long 500 kilometers no, wide it's 1500 kilometers 1500 long. kilometers long yeah and it's from the abu dhabi to salala it's the world's biggest sand desert yes. right that's back in 2016 you you crossed the desert on a bicycle for with 21 team, days with my british with my very funny british teammate steve so why would you ride a bicycle in the sand? It sounds kind of... Well, it's a special like, bicycle, Nadia. It is a special bicycle? Yeah, hmm, I was going to ask you it's that It's not question. a road bike, yeah. It's a, it's a fat bike. The which, tires must be different. Yes, different. and there's no chain. There's a carbon belt drive. Oh, and There's yeah. no gears. They're internal gears. Because the chain would get all messed up oh, and yeah. muddy. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't last uh, three days. Yeah. And um, why would you want to bike in the desert? Oh, my God. Well, now to that you've said with, there's a special bike, yes, I can see yes. that it oh, might yeah. be more interesting. We did have to push it a few times because sometimes the sand is so fine, y y your foot goes through. Yeah. Um, yeah. But look, I believe I'm a biker. OK, so maybe I'm a bit biased. Mm -hmm. But I believe biking is the best way to discover a place. Walking is too slow in a car. You have noise, you have the smell, yeah? you're, there's something between. Biking is a perfect thing. And the desert, Nadia, I'm in love with the desert. Why? I fell in love with the How desert. How hot was it? It was very hot. Yeah. So what do you like about Although it? Although it was in November, December. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, I've been trying for the past two years to get the Saudi government to allow me to do it again, only with a different route, which I find more sexy. Wow, and a sexy desert. Is it like the sh the shapes of the dunes? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You don't have to answer that. So they haven't approved your your next uh, no. Bike well, ride? they said yes, and they said your thing is on 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 the desk of God knows who in the, in the presidential palace, but then it all fell through. So now Saudi government, if you're listening, please approve Maxim Shaya's request. It's called Brak Biking Rub Al Khali okay. Brak. Okay. Okay. And. Uh, and I think it would shed, uh, you know, um, very positive light on this misunderstood thing called the desert. The desert is amazingly beautiful. You spend one night in the desert and you'll start to understand what I mean. OK. Um, and then these dunes, they, they change every single day. They're sculpted by, by the wind, by, by, by God, by whatever you want to call it. It's just amazingly beautiful. And it's and it's not it's shades of, of, of all possible colors. And and to, to experience it raw like that, just you and your bike and sleeping in a, fl in a flimsy tent. Yeah, so every night you stop and you sleep in a tent? Oh, yes. Every night we had to stop and find the cache where we had buried our food and water. Oh, my God. What do you mean? I had, I'd been there before in four by fours oh, to bury my food and water. I needed more than 12 liters of water per person per day. 12 liters is 12 kilos. 
We, it took 21 days. Can you imagine? I mean, yeah. There's no way you can carry your water. So how, did no you, wa- how can you find your caches when the sand mm. dunes are continuously shape-shifting? Oh, no, they don't shift that quickly. That much? And, uh, and also, they, they would not move, you know. So you've uh, marked them on your map, I, I imagine? Or on, my, on my GPS. On your GPS? On my device, yes. Okay. Yes. And I did, well, there was other things. But yeah, we never missed one. And only one was vandalized by the foxes, the very last one, because there's a lot of there was a lot of um, chalk in the ground close to Salala, okay. and I wasn't able to dig deep enough to burn them deep enough for the foxes not so to So the smell. foxes vandalized your yeah. stocks of water and food. So after 83 kilometers of, I had to bike to a nearby village because we had come close to. I'd bike another 23 plus 23, mm-hmm. 46 kilometers to buy food for myself and Steve and come back to camp to be able to finish. Chocolate? Actually, we didn't know. <laughs> well, well, yeah, lots of biscuits, but no, biscuits. we bought uh, tuna and, and cheese and bread. Is there like a, when you're doing this kind of stuff, like how do you, does it matter how you eat or is it just about getting calories? <clears throat> Let me tell you a story on my way to the South Pole where I almost asked for an evacuation because Although we were on a 5,500 calorie diet, I lost a lot of weight and then I got cold and I frosted my nose and my veins showed everywhere and I got very weak. And I wrote down that although there was five of us, among us there was a cook. That cook cooks every single possible cuisine you can think of. Mm -hmm. You do not hear him or her. You do not see him or her. His name or her name? Hunger. When you're hungry, you eat just about anything. And yeah. everything tastes great. Yeah. You just want the calories. So it doesn't matter. And you don't get different energy. Like if you eat chocolate, like in a regular day, it's not that um, you don't feel that, I don't know, energized. Or you kind of have that dip of the sugar dip. Uh, that, choc- I guess that chocolate doesn't is a lot of calories. Yeah. What you need is calories. You just gotta it doesn't get... matter from and, what. And, and chocolate is, is a lot of calories per weight. Mm. Well, of course, you shouldn't eat chocolate all the time. But I ate more chocolate on my North Pole trip and on my Indian Ocean trip than I... Uh, than, than ever in my life. But um, when, for example, when I was seasick in the first two weeks, there's nothing you can eat in the beginning, but chocolate is readily available and it's, and it's good to eat and, 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 and it's a lot of calories. Mm. It's not good for your teeth, it's not good for you, but what you need is the calories. Yeah. Yeah. So you have that. So you were seasick and there were no men's room on the boat. Our boat was eight and a <laughs> half, eight and a half, my boat was eight and a half meters wide. Okay. Uh, sorry, long. long. Uh, what uh, meter eight h- wide? Uh, there's no toilet. There's no running water. You have like a sleeping bag. You just like lie in the bottom. No of the sleeping boat. bag. There's a cabin at the front and the cabin at the okay. back. And every time you go into the cabin, it's still wet from the sweat from the guy before you. Oh no! Yes, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> So you, have, actually, you have to move out of your comfort zone to do things yeah, like this. Yeah, and you must get really close also with your uh, your teammates when you're oh, doing these yes. kinds of oh, things, yes. right? We what, almost so had a fist fight, really? myself and uh, Levar. About what? Oh, you know, when you're in a very harsh environment and um, it's only normal. Yeah. But then uh, being the captain, I had to think of a way to avert that. And I told Levar, listen, let's find, we disagree on a lot of things, okay? But let's agree on one thing. I told him, there's, there's, there's actually one thing we can agree on. And he says, no. I told him, yes, there is. And he says, no, 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 there isn't. I said, listen, don't, can't we agree that we both want to get to Mauritius as quickly and as safely as possible? Mm. So I told him, rather than fight, why don't you sit there and fight the waves and you row as many hours as you can and then I'm going to beat you. He rowed eight hours straight. <laughs> I then went and rode six and I told him you win. Wow. Conflict resolution 101 right there. Oh, yes. And then like a week later, I told him we both won because we got close and we, we, we won a world record by a yeah. few hours. So that made it. That was that was smart tactic. So you have a pretty unusual job, right? Is this what your job, like being an adventurer? Is this how you, I mean, it's not a traditional career choice. Is there? Are you doing other things on the side to kind of... Make it um, lucrative? <laughs> <laughs> lucrative. 
Well, adventurers don't need that much lucrative. I don't get my kicks from driving a Ferrari or... or, or uh, but, but but yes, I do other things. I do talks to large companies where I... It's, it's entitled There's an Everest for Everyone, where I make the link between what we do on the mountain or in expedition and life in general and business in particular. And I've addressed big companies like uh, Coca-Cola and General Motors and... Johnson and Johnson and Hewlett Packard and all these guys, uh, so I do this still. Yeah, but well, my but main, but mm -hmm. my main, I still enjoy the outdoors. But what's new now is that I enjoy getting others to enjoy the outdoors, and it's even more rewarding than doing it yourself. Uh, but I haven't neglected myself. So on the third of August, I travel to China where I'll be attempting to climb Mustag Atta. What, what is that? Mustag Atta is a beautiful mountain. It's 7,546 meters high. And I will be attempting it with no oxygen, of course. And on skis, on backcountry skis with seal skins at the bottom. And with with seal skin at the bottom? Yeah, you know, the, you know, the backcountry ski equipment. Well, I, I I used to, I'm from Canada, I used to do, I call it cross-country skiing, Cross-country right? is different. Different, oh. But uh, backcountry... We country, didn't have seal skin on our skis. You had You had fish scales. No, I don't think we had that either. They were just like cheap skis. <laughs> no, you cannot you cannot ski forward unless you're skating. No, no, no. Well, there's a zillion Cross types of skis. Cross-country skiing. Cross-country skiing. There was the, no animal skin. You definitely have fish scales at the bottom. Also, I went to school in Canada. Yeah. Which school did you go to? In Canada? Yes. Like you mean like college? Yes. Concordia? Okay, but which school? I went to school. Oh. School, like, like not college, but school. Oh, I went to a school um, called FACE. Faith. FACE. 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 It was actually, it, it's short for Fine Arts Core Education. It was a school that had a okay, uh, music and theater program in huh? Montreal. Montreal. Yeah. Oh, I went to, where did you go to school? I went to Stansted College on the border near Sherbrooke. That the, sounds much more um, sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, well, and then I went to Ashbury, which is in Rockcliffe Park, which is in Ottawa. And on yeah. Ashbury, for example, we had to wear, we were not allowed to wear jeans even on a five-mile radius. Instead. And we had to wear a tie every single day. So, yes, it was a posh school. It was in French or English? English. Well, no, Ashbury was super English. So was Stansted, but we did learn French from a teacher we used to call TR7 because his nose, his nose resembled. TR7? Uh, yes. Who's TR7? TR7 is a car made by Triumph and his nose looked oh. like a TR7. And he, he spoke English like I speak, like he spoke terrible. Oh, I'm sorry, he what? spoke French. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very confused. He spoke French he, like you speak. No, no, no. He spoke French. He spoke terrible French. Oh, okay. Terrible French. Terrible French Canadian. And he was your French teacher? He was. Oh, well, French Canadian sounds terrible, even if you speak it well. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't nice. blame him. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say that. You can say that. Um, well, you can say it if you want, because it's true. Um, <laughs> it's actually, you know, that when with uh, French Canadian uh, shows, when they um, syndicate them in France, they put subtitles on the bottom so that <laughs> French people can understand what they're saying. Lol. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. So you're actually very well-known uh, personality. You have your own uh, Wikipedia page, which is, you know, not everyone has that. Um, you, you've had a stamp uh, made for you in this country here, Lebanon. And um, your your phrase that you use, that you base your talks on, there's an Everest for everyone, is uh, pretty well-known. I mean, you've kind of... Uh, you know, brought it to the forefront. Hammered it in. Hammered it into us. What does it mean, though? It means something that I believe in very, very fondly. Um, we come into this planet or this life for a very short period of time. And it would be a shame for any of us not to discover what it is that drives them, what, what it is that they're passionate about, and, you know, do it full-fledged uh, during this short period we call... Uh, like, um, I'm sure there are a lot, of, a lot of people who, because either they are lazy or they don't challenge themselves or they don't try and, you know, try new things to see what it is they're passionate about, they, they, they miss huge opportunities. And that's a shame. Well, Maxime, you make it look so fun. You make everything look so fun and easy. Thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your inspiring stories. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us in the men's room. Don't forget to subscribe to our show if you haven't already. And also check us out on hackawadi.com and let us know what you think. Adios. <laughs> <laughs>